Welcome, and on the behalf of the Friends of Harriet Beecher Stowe House, we respectfully acknowledge that the ground on which we stand are traditional Miami and Shawnee lands. We extend our esteem and gratitude to the indigenous people who call this place home. Welcome to the Harriet Beecher Stowe House online and our session of the Power of Voice discussion series. Tonight, we're gonna to be talking about two voices for Black America, and those two voices happen to be Booker T. Washington and W.E.B. Du Bois. Our sponsor for the point uh, for the Power of Voice series are School Outfitters, Bringing Learning Spaces to Life, and Heinemann, an internationally recognized fine art auction house. We are grateful for their support. You can find more information on both of those linked to this page on our website. And I want to also shout out School Outfitters because they did give us a small discount when we just purchased tables, <clears throat> picnic tables for our new outdoor classroom education space and picnic area, which if all goes to plan will be installed like right before the birthday party in June because that's how much time leave that we need to get the stuff in. <clears throat> they need to get this done. Anyway, it, it, whatever. Um, sorry, I'm getting off track. Um, you'll also want to check out our website for information on discussions, lectures, and our current exhibits. So we're going to get the discussion started tonight. We'll go for an hour, probably a little bit more as we tend to do. Mute yourself when you're not speaking, but feel free to virtual hand raise or just jump in when you're ready to contribute. Tonight's discussion leaders from Xavier University are Professors John Getz and Janice Walker. And let's take it away. Thanks, Chris. Uh, let's look at the timeline first, as we okay. usually do. All righty. Timeline is coming up. Okay. You see my timeline now? There we go. Can you see it okay? Uh, John, I can't hear you. What's going on? And I've tried to highlight uh, the. Oh, okay. Hmm. I'm not muted. Okay, now you're fine. Okay. Uh, yeah, I've tried to highlight the Booker T. Washington key events in red and the Du Bois, uh, W.E.B. Du Bois in blue. So uh, I hope that helps you to, uh, to see how their lives intertwine. Uh, Booker was born into slavery, and that's a key difference between these two. Uh, du Bois is born after the Civil War, three years after the Civil War. He's also born in the North in Great Barrington, Massachusetts. Um, and although there are enslaved people in his past, obviously he is, uh, he is uh, born as a free person uh, uh, three year, uh, 12 years actually after Booker. Uh, Booker is born uh, in Virginia. So big difference between the two of them already. At the time Du Bois is born uh, and he has uh, a great grandfather on one side who actually fought in the colonial army during the American Revolution and who earned his freedom by doing that, a formerly enslaved person. Uh, William's, father, uh, desert, w, uh, William's father deserts the family uh, soon after his son's birth. And about this time, Booker is starting to go to school and he is asked for his last name he doesn't have one. So he chooses Washington after his stepfather, Washington Ferguson, whom he did get along with pretty well. Uh, and he later learns that his mother had named him Booker. And I think I've got the Southern pronunciation here. Can you say that one more time, John? Uh, and he adds that as his middle name. Which one? Which part? The tell is it Talaferro? Would you cut out when you when it, that you said that? Oh, okay. I you were breaking I out. Pronounced Talafer. 
Now, okay. I don't know if that's the way he said it, but uh, I think that's kind of a Southern pronunciation of that name. Um, in 1872, he enrolls at Hampton Normal and Agricultural Institute, graduates with honors a few years later, does a couple of years of teaching, and then by that time, Reconstruction has come to an end, uh, and uh, the country, it, some people have said, was very close to a second civil war at that time if Reconstruction did not come to an end. Uh, Tensions were very high uh, between North and South once again. He spent in Washington uh, and uh, didn't finish. Uh, interesting experience he had there. Didn't like some of the students who came from more middle class or upper class uh, backgrounds. They were black students, but he felt very different from them because of his background. Uh, and uh, couldn't maybe be too comfortable with handling some of the work that, uh, that they were asked to, some of the thinking that they were asked to do. At Hampton, and then big event, 1881, Normal and Industrial Institute in Tuskegee, Alabama, which is, happens to be Janice Walker's alma mater. She can talk about that a little bit uh, later. Uh, du Bois is pursuing his own education at Fisk University in Nashville. It kind of led a somewhat slightly sheltered life up in the north, but he certainly encountered both the rich culture in the south and the racism of, uh, of in rural black schools uh, while he was in college at Fisk. Um, then he goes on to graduate from Harvard and get a master's degree from Harvard and starts teaching uh, in 1894 at Wilberforce in Ohio. And some of, some of the people here may have gone. Uh, of kind of a flirtation between Du Bois and teaching at Tuskegee that went on for several years. Uh, he actually got an offer from Tuskegee uh, at this time, but he had already accepted the job at Wilberforce. So he, uh, uh, he, took, he had to take that job instead. Got a doctorate from Harvard, became the first black American to do that. Uh, and his dissertation on the African slave trade was published uh, uh, soon after that. Um, big event for Washington comes in 1895, when he delivered the address that I hope some of you read uh, at the, uh, the address for the opening of the Cotton States and International Exposition at Atlanta, Georgia, 1895. Um, and uh, it was quite a remarkable, uh, a remarkable moment. Uh, it became known eventually as the, as the Atlanta Compromise speech. That was what Du Bois would call it, uh, and the term kind of stuck. Um, du Bois actually praised the speech, and uh, everybody praised it, really. Uh, he even got a letter of congratulations from President Grover Cleveland, uh, saying what a, what a great speech it was. We can talk more about why Du Bois might have been drawn to that speech later, but they were, at least to some extent, on the same page at that point. This was, by the way, just seven months after the death of Frederick Douglass, the iconic black leader who had, uh, who had really dominated the, uh, the 19th century uh, as a spokesperson for, uh, for black America. Uh, so who would be his successor? And Washington kind of stepped up at this point. Um, unfortunately, a year later, we had the Supreme Court upholding segregation in the Plessy versus Ferguson decision, uh, which in retrospect, Du Bois would blame on, in part on the Atlanta exposition speech. He didn't say that at the time. This is years later, looking back, he thinks that maybe it wouldn't have happened without that speech. Um, by 1897, Du Bois is teaching at Atlanta University, Black, uh, traditionally uh, black university. Uh, 
while Tuskegee begins to flourish under, um, under Washington's guidance, William McKinley as president visits um, and uh, eventually uh, uh, Du Bois will even be invited to the White House, or not Du Bois, Washington will be invited to the White House to dine with President Theodore Roosevelt in 1901 after the publication of his biography Up From Slavery, which again was praised by Du Bois and actually became the best uh, known book by a black American writer for the next 50 years. And it got him in, uh, well, that and his activities at Tuskegee won in the favor of Theodore Roosevelt and his connections with Roosevelt contributed to the development of what Du Bois would call the Tuskegee machine in which Washington had a tremendous amount of impact on political appointments for uh, black people and came to have an enormous influence, particularly in that first decade of the, uh, of the 20th century. A lot of patronage jobs, um, yeah, though his influence began, began to decline by about 19, well, once Roosevelt left office. Um, but he still had the ear of William Howard Taft to some extent. Uh, 1903 is important for Du Bois, that's when he published The Souls of Black Folk, his most famous work, um, in which he argues that the problem of the 20th century is the problem of the color line, the relation of the darker to the lighter races of men in Asia and Africa, in America and the islands of the sea. Interestingly, the book includes a chapter of Mr. Booker T. Washington and others, which attacks Washington's positions on education and race relations. Well, you might say, why then does he wind, does Du Bois wind up teaching summer school at Tuskegee? That his book published, Dying at Washington Home. Well, Washington had heard words from other people. And he actually said to somebody, if he chooses to be little, we must teach him a lesson by being greater and broader than he. When they go high, or when they go low, we go high. <laughs> Sounds familiar. Uh, so, uh, but he did not. Uh, uh, he did not get a permanent position or take a permanent position at Tuskegee. But he did teach summer school that year. Uh, he also wrote the talented tenth that year. Du Bois did, uh, which was published originally as an es essay in a book called The Negro Problem and then eventually published in the book form that some of you might have downloaded uh, uh, to read for this, uh, for this event. There's a key event later, late in 1903, that really contributed to the split between uh, Du Bois and, uh, and Washington. And it was the so-called Boston riot. It wasn't really a riot, uh, but some, uh, Washington was speaking in Boston and some protesters threw cayenne pepper at the stage, causing as many of the speakers to sneeze. Um, and then they started heckling Washington, trying to pin him down in his positions about uh, black voting rights and, and some other issues. He was highly offended. The protesters were arrested. And that was a breaking point between the two of them because Du Bois, uh, du Bois sided with the uh, protesters and uh, felt that they had a legitimate point not throwing. Hey, John, John, can you hang oh. on? Uh, Barbara had a question. Oh, okay. Or yeah. Yeah. Yes. Interject. Go ahead. Un unmute. Sorry. I, I just want to raise the name of William Munro Trotter. Yes. Um, I don't want to leave it unspecified. Um, Trotter was the one who led the the Boston riot, uh, and he was also um, participating or partnering with Du Bois in terms of the Niagara movement. So I want to make sure his name is there. That's a good point to make. And in fact, soon after the Boston riot, Du Bois went and stayed at Trotter's house. Yes. 
and that really offended uh, Washington. And for 15 years, I headed the Trotter Institute at UMass Boston. Ah. So I'm particularly in favor of Trotter. Okay. <laughs> I did not want him ignored to be named or not good, mentioned. So thank good, you. good point to add. Thank you. Um, so, and indeed, by 1905, Du Bois, Trotter, and others formed the Niagara Movement uh, to uh, chart a more activist course than Washington. And now they were organized against him, and the battle lines were sort of drawn at that point. Um, and this led to the forming of the NAACP in 1909. Uh, and uh, the next year, Du Bois, uh, Wooten Du Bois was part of that. And uh, the next year he founded and began editing its official publication, The Crisis, which will become the most widely read African-American magazine of its time. And he continued to edit that all the way up until 1934. And that published literature as well as uh, as well as political writings, Langston Hughes, a number of writers from the Harlem Renaissance uh, were published in the uh, in crisis. Um, Washington became a little more edgy, a little more activist in the last couple of years of his life. He did write to President Woodrow Wilson protesting the new federal segregation policies, but found that he no longer had any influence in the White House. Uh, Wilson did not pay any attention to him. Um, and he died uh, uh, in Tuskegee in 1915. Du Bois, reflecting on Washington's death many years later, said, I believe he died a sad and disillusioned man betrayed by white America. He said, I don't know that. He never told me that, but, uh, but I, think that's, uh, I think that was probably how he was feeling because he did participate uh, in a couple of uh, legal cases, surreptitiously trying to get black voting rights and break down segregation. Barbara, look, you wanted to talk again. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, did he not um, die shortly after he was discovered in a hotel room with a white woman? I am not aware of that. But <laughs> well, I think that might be discovered and looked at. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Um, okay, last, uh, just a couple of the, the later events in Du Bois's life. He did write a history of Reconstruction in 1935, which was important because, thick. yeah, go ahead. I was just saying it's real thick. Yes, and <laughs> it, it, well, he was a serious sociologist, a social scientist, uh, a true academic, a researcher, a scholar, and uh, this was an attempt to set straight the, uh, uh, the historical view of and created qualified blacks, got into political office, ruined everything, and what he was showing is that it wasn't a failure at all. Lots of important gains were made. Barbara? Um, excuse me again, but would we at some point next year maybe take on Black Reconstruction? Would that be possible? I, I haven't read it. I've looked at it. I was daunted, but I would love to read it in conjunction with others if that might fit in with the, within the rubric of this um, series of studies and discussions. Interesting idea. We're always looking for suggestions, so let me... Uh... I will make a note of that. Don, that's an interest of mine too. I've done a little bit of reading and it's fascinating. Yeah. Uh, an untold story that um, I was very surprised to learn as much of what I, I thought I was a little bit more informed and it's just really fascinating. And I'm working on a novel which kind of covers that period. And so I would love, I'm, I'm kind of looking at, uh, what's his name? Um, Birth of a Nation, Dixon. Uh, I'm looking at Dixon and looking at a black family in the South and a black family at the North and telling it from another perspective. So I would love to read and study the reconstruction that Du Bois wrote. Okay, sounds promising. <laughs> okay. What we can do. Um, 
Du Bois continued to work for the NAACP uh, and until 1944 or until 48. He was actually part of the founding convention of the United Nations uh, in his uh, role with the NAACP. Um, and then probably uh, and wound up, uh, interestingly, by 1953, the 50 year anniversary of the Souls of Black Folk was published. And in the preface there, he wrote that essentially what he's saying is that uh, when I look back, the problem, the essential problem wasn't so much race as it was social class. He had moved yeah. enough Very into a, a more Marxist perspective by that mm -hmm. time. Uh, and he felt that race was a cover for uh, social class that was uh, the deepest of, uh, of conflicts. Uh, and then he wound up living in Ghana and uh, becoming a citizen and died, interestingly, on the eve of the March on Washington in 1963. So enough, uh, enough of the background, let's start talking about the texts. And let me turn it over to Janice and ask uh, Chris to put on on screen that picture uh, or picture or pictures of from the of the statue from the Tuskegee campus of Booker T. Washington lifting the veil of ignorance, a statue that was built uh, was put up in 1922. Okay, so Janice can. <laughs> So I'm just going to mention that John asked me to put up this picture of a statue and I looked at the statue and I'm like, you can't just put up one picture of one of the statue because there's so many parts to it. So here is the statue that is in question. This is kind of the overall scene and you can see kind of the plaza area of the statue. And then you hone in on what's underneath and it says, you know, has his birth date and death date. And then he lifted the veil of ignorance from his people and pointed the way to progress through education and industry. And then now you have a picture of the actual bronze part of the statue, which is this the, the best one to kind of hone in on? Yes. Okay. Do we know who the artist was? Uh. I don't. I, I was don't. just curious. Yeah. I mean, the, the, the faces are so, I mean, they're so lifelike. It's, yeah, it's a pretty it striking yeah. um, statue. And um, many, many people, when they would visit campus, would take pictures there. I was telling John and Christina that uh, I remember I was in a group of students uh, on an NSF grant. And we were lined up in front of it. And I remember that was the first time I was really, really close to it and came away with the same impression, Barbara, how lifelike the yeah. statue. And it was much bigger than you think um, when you see it in a postcard. But it's not, you know, it wasn't in, in the center of campus where you see it every day. It was a little bit off of campus um, and you sort of have to know where it is. Still, you know, on main campus, but not as obvious as you would think. You know, you mm -hmm. would think when you walk on campus, you, you would see it. That's a national monument, I think, it, isn't mm -hmm. it? Yeah. So it's pretty, pretty famous, pretty um, well known. And, you know, when you visit, of course, you're, you're gonna see many, uh, go to the gift shop, many, um, postcards with a various <laughs> pictures of you know that you can that you can purchase so as John said I uh, I graduated from Tuskegee so did my parents and four of my five siblings so it's and it was my mother's home uh, uh, she grew up in Tuskegee and uh, that wasn't the reason I think uh, we all went there at the time it was um, a prestigious institution, uh, one of the uh, ones that uh, I had opportunities to go to other historically black institutions, but um, this one had a very special reputation. And, you know, and I was, uh, we call Booker T, Booker T, uh, not President Washington or anything like that, but he was known as 
Booker T this and, or Booker T that. And I, although I knew of the, you know, the books he had written and, you know, a, a good amount about his, his uh, life, I, it was very interesting to read the, the books and the articles. And I knew about the uh, different uh, uh, positions that Du Bois and Washington Booker T had, but it was sort of illuminating to read their writings, particularly at this time of my life. Um, I, I don't know if I would have walked away thinking, reflecting as I am now, had I read those at a much earlier age. I, I just, I'm just more mature. I've seen a lot. And, and there I can make um, a lot more connections than I think I would have uh, made um, early. And Tuskegee, you know, I, I'll tell you a little bit about it. it. You know, other than it was very well known. Uh, um, at the time I went there, it was, a, as I said, very prestigious. And it was, um, they pushed us pretty hard to, to excel. And a lot of us, there were, I had a lot of friends who went on to get medical degrees, who went, uh, who, were, who are vets, who are, went to grad school. And I have to tell you that I met Lionel Ritchie my freshman year. <laughs> <laughs> he was in the Commodores uh, before they became very wow. well known. They were there. Uh, so it was a, it was a great experience uh, for me. And from, th at the time, th we didn't have, we couldn't, other schools were not open to us. Uh, I'll put it that way. And, and so all the, um, all the, all the students who were really, um, uh, many, I should say, who were very bright, who were very dedicated uh, and committed to academic um, work were there. And um, I can tell you many people who, who have roots or have their beginnings at a historically back school, not just Tuskegee, but others, uh, because the, we weren't, the doors weren't open to us at, at, at the other schools. So with that said, um, I'm going to launch into the first question. So if you look at the photo of, of that, that famous statue um, on the screen, uh, lifting the veil of ignorance, um, in Ralph Allison's 1952 novel, Invisible Man, some of you probably know or should know, it's a, or will know about it. The narrator recalls a similar statue on the campus of his college and wonders if the veil is really being lifted or lowered more firmly in place. So based on your reading of Washington's Atlantic, Atlanta uh, address and whatever else you know about him, do you think he was lifting the veil or lowering it? making things better or worse for Black people in the United States? Who wants to begin? I guess, um, Christina, we can, we, can, we can go back to see any, everyone. Oh, I don't know. The statue probably looks better than me. Uh, I was actually, I, I, it's not cheating if I was comparing notes before the meeting with someone else, but I was telling them that I thought that I believe it was Mr. Washington's intention to help out, whether or not he's effectively communicating that. Well, okay, no, he's not effectively communicating that. If I believe he really had their best intentions at heart, he did not. His word choice left a little more than a bit to be desired in the speech that we read. But if you are willing to overlook some of the flashpoints, some of the the, the very the, the little sound bites that are clearly going to offend you know the educated or at least the people that you know want to see society bettered, I think fundamentally what he was saying was correct. It was just just 
just tried too hard to to cater to the audience that he was speaking to and inadvertently probably lost the majority of the support from the people he was really trying to help. But that's my impression based on what I read. By background, I, I'm in corporate finance, right? I, I, you know, understand economics, that type of thing. And so I'm reading the thing going, I understand um, what he's saying about how the markets will most appreciate uh, uh, people that, you know, are contributing to it. He's not wrong. That's absolutely correct. That's very Adam Smith, invisible hand, you know, it's true. And, but it, it just, it starts you down the road of, well, if economics is the sole barometer, if that's your sole measure of success, you know, I mean, <clears throat> capitalism tends to be a moral, that's a discussion for a different day. So if you're really trying to better society, is that the most effective or efficient way to do it? So that was, those were just my starting thoughts. Thank you, Eric. Any comment, any other comments? Any um, agreement or disagreement or you want to add to that, Barbara? Um, yeah, when I look back at this speech um, a few days ago, I was thinking about some of the inventors uh, primarily in the North, uh, Black inventors at that time, um, who were contributing more than muscle, uh, which is what at least I was reading him to, uh, him being Washington. I was reading him to say that, um, you know, in the past, um, it has been the muscle, Black muscle that has um, kind of contributed to and carried and supported uh, the industry of this country. Uh, and that's not, that's not exclusively true. Um, I'm thinking of Jan Metzliger in um, Massachusetts, who in 1883, 12 years prior to um, this speech by Washington, who revolutionized the shoe industry uh, around the world, taking it from uh, a million dollar industry to a billion dollar industry. Uh, but he himself never benefited from um, the uh, contribution and the invention that he made. I'm thinking, of course, of Latimer. Um, and there were others who were really on the basis of their ingenuity and intelligence, really moving industry and business forward. Uh, but they were relegated to the sidelines. So I don't think it was just the black muscle that had to be included uh, and recognized in white America. Um, and I must admit that I might not be entirely as open to um, Washington as I might be, um, given that, well, I grew up partially in the South. My mother was a teacher um, who graduated from Payne in um, Augusta, Georgia, and then went to NYU for a master's, as so many Black teachers did at the time. Um, but she decided that there would be so little opportunity for me in the South that she sent me to Canada for high school, and then I got the rest of my education, including my doctorate in the North. Uh, and there was, there was that discrepancy that if you were Black in the South, you, um, you could not drink from the same water fountains, you could not go to the same bathrooms, you could not eat in the same restaurants, you could not shop even necessarily in the same stores. Uh, there was the class division, and however much your family might have fared well. My great great grandfather fared well. He fared well because he happened to, to find or his daughter discovered on their property um, silver and other goods that had been um, buried during the Civil War. And so they were able to um, buy more land and buy more implements and um, kind of rise up 
but, but they rose up on the basis of their ingenuity, their numbers of children. That's another thing that I'm discovering, that the Black families had children as they loved their children, but their children were also part of their wealth. Their children worked. Their children contributed to the family. And these were striving, hardworking people who educated themselves and pushed themselves forward despite all the opposition against them. And the opposition against them was murderous. I'm sorry. No, no. Um, you know, I don't know what, whether to add to that or, but I, I think I'm going to let Amy talk since she was, um, had her hand up a minute ago. But Amy, before, Barbara, I live a part of that because I, uh, I was actually born in Mississippi, and I think there are stories, I know there are stories that my parents never told us. Yeah, they uh, didn't want to hurt why us. They didn't want to hurt us. Why we moved, and we moved to northern Florida. They both were born in Alabama, um, and um, I, I just have so many memories as a little girl that... I, continue to haunt me even to this day yeah. and you mentioned some of the things we couldn't do just brought up um, some of the memories of me discovering that I was different yeah. um, and not only you, you mentioned some things we couldn't do but we couldn't live in the same neighborhoods we couldn't go to the go same to the restaurants same we couldn't same go schools? to the same no. churches. We couldn't go to the same schools. I remember my brother tried to use a library and they called the police. And I remember how, I can remember to this day how frightened I was when the word went through school that my brother, that, that, that the police, my brother tried to go use a library because our library didn't have a book. And they called the police and he could not, they ran him out. Um, and, and so the, how harmless is it to use a library? But anyway, uh, yeah. I, as I said, I can go on and on. Um, you don't forget, you don't get over those things. Um, Amy. Sorry, I'm not sure how I can follow that. Plus, I um I have a ton of notes, so please bear with me. Um, for what it's worth, it, that happened in Cincinnati too. So even though a lot of us think we're removed from some of those discriminatory practices, I have friends whose grandparents remember that happening here as well, and we're not that far removed. Um, and I think part of my processing both of the readings for today, it's hard to take it out of our current context. I mean, just to kind of answer the original question, um, Booker T. Washington was one of the figures we wrote about when I was in school. We would do a, a report on him every February. Um, I don't personally think that Black history should be confined to one month. I think Black history is American history. Um, but where that brings me to my kind of the conflation today, there were news articles about the new legislation pending in our Ohio legislature it's, it was originally predominantly to curtail discussions of gender, but they threw race in there as well. And so I took some notes from the article that it prohibits, what do they call it, divisive topics or inherently racist comments, including critical race theory, the 1619 project, and diversity and equity and inclusion topics, which would all be included in the essays we read for today. So I'm kind of like shivering and shaking because it makes me so angry. So to actually kind of answer the question, maybe, is it the value, but also what I think some people are afraid of with education and libraries is the knowledge that people gain there, which just infuriates me because I personally as a librarian <laughs> believe that that information should be equitably available to everyone. And it's infuriating that even now, all these years later, it's still a topic and still people's ability to grow and educate themselves is being curtailed. Um, but to the essay that, that um, we have from Mr. Washington, uh, Dr. Washington, 
Um, one of the paragraphs that stuck out to me, keeping in mind his audience, is on page two, where it says, nearly 16 millions of hands will aid you in pulling the load upward, or they will pull against you the load downward. And he goes on to talk about, in contrast, what would happen if people are not educated versus when they are, and how essentially a rising tide lifts all boats is basically what he's saying. And, and the way I read that is he's, he's getting that message out there, but also being mindful of who his audience was, so that it's kind of a spoonful of sugar with his message, if that makes sense. No, that does make sense. I, uh, I, I circled, I, I noted that paragraph to Amy um, and thought, interestingly, you know, some of the, I felt he was headed down one road and when I got to that paragraph, I thought, now if I hadn't read the, what came before that, I would have a different impression, uh, a, a, a better impression, I should say, of the overall article. But then he goes back to how he started towards the end. But anyway, it, it made me think that, you know, maybe he's, there's more there than what he is willing to say publicly. I don't know. It feels like it's in between the lines. Right. Um, Barb, Eric, Joanne, Tony, Mary, Norma, would, Richard, would you like to comment before we move on to the next question? Sure, I would if I could. Um, sure. I, I just, in the last paragraph, I thought it was really interesting, the section where he says, um, well, he calls it the great and intricate problem which God has laid at the doors of the South. And I think that plays into what you were just saying that, that you know, he had some strong points to make here, but he had, a, he had to soften it because of the white audience that he was speaking to. And it just, it makes me want to scream out that, you know, the, the people he's talking to or the, the white people of the South were the ones who made the problems, not God laying them in the, the doorstep of the South. So um, it must have been very difficult for him, I, I would imagine to have to hold back like that, you know, and to, in other parts of the, of the speech to, to talk about his, his um, crowd as friends. He also says next door neighbors, he uses words like that. And it just seems like that would be very difficult rather than just letting it fly, you know, and being more direct as W.E.B. Du Bois was in the section that we read for him. So that's all I wanted to say. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I would say my only, my only other observation, if I may, is that uh, um, he he does, I at least read in there where Mr. Washington is definitely relying on people's ability to respect the rule of law, which is, a, I can't pretend to understand or relate, but it is, you know, the, the creation of laws that are inherently discriminatory or, you know, which is, it's like that was that is ultimately, or that is one of the reasons why I think that his message just didn't, his heart was in the right place, but it didn't work because all, of the, all the things he was saying that groups could not do to each other, specifically the groups that the white Southerners should be doing to African-Americans is exactly what was happening. So it's like, you can tell them not to do that, but that's not really going to change their behavior. And we've lived with that for a hundred years or, well, well what is several hundred, several, a while, we're still with it now. Joanne, you were going to say something. When I when I uh, looked at this speech, um, I was looking at it from the perspective of potentially even a political statement, and the contrast between the way he approached it and the way you might approach it to be more effective. Um, but at the same time, in all fairness, putting it in the context of the environment he was in and the time and the place, which made, made it different. But I felt that there, the, the us and them was so strong. There wasn't, while he would appear to be trying to 
um, bring the opposites together, he succeeded in emphatically saying, you and us, you know, you, you're out there, you're the white guys, we're the black guys, mm -hmm. as opposed to taking, starting out with an inclusive approach and moving forward from there. Um, I was thinking of some of the, the speeches uh, um, last year of Reverend Warnock um, and, and how he was able to bridge the divide. Now, whether that was even a possibility for Washington to do that, given the environment that, that existed in 1895 is a question. But from a PR standpoint, from um, um, a, a rhetorical standpoint, it seems to me that there he lost an opportunity to start out we together but instead it was hey you guys and us guys and that separation i think helped to um along with a lot of other things that happened in the speech really helped to um convey some mixed messages and also ended up i would think if i were the white person hearing what he was saying i would want to try and um and take it in and that's me i don't mean that those people necessarily did but I, I would keep going but you just said but and but you're saying you're we're i'm different and i'm we're doing all these things wrong and we're, we can't get ourselves together and and i don't think i would feel walk away from his speech feeling um inspired to do to do good or to um to try and pull together with him. Mm -hmm. You know, I, it, it, it didn't leave me with that kind of an emotional um, uh, force. Mm -hmm. John, I'm gonna turn it, ask you to do, uh, take, take the next question, but I- I did, I did wanna make a comment. Oh, one go ahead, more comment just to, uh, yeah. about the original question, whether this is yeah. a, a blanket coming yeah. over. <laughs> And uh, there was a line, you know, we had a lot of mixed messages in this, and uh, there was a great line about um, no race can prosper till it learns that there is as much dignity in tilling a field as in writing a poem. But then he goes on to say, it is at the bottom of life we must begin, and not at the top, nor should we permit our grievances to overshadow our opportunities. And that to me is like, well, what does that mean? We just have to kind of be real nice and um, mm -hmm. and and, uh, and and just let I, it, it. It's you know definitely something there where they're just saying, take take it easy, don't don't get too excited, you know. Richard, that that was the point exactly I was going to make before. It. John, uh, but I, I was, yeah, yeah when I was going to say, John, I I wanted to. I just felt that so much of it was about what the African Americans for Blacks should do. I mean, it was all on us to yep. do, and it was, you know, everybody else, you know, and when he talks about, you know, we, what we've done, we have without strikes and labor wars, we've killed your fields, cleared your forests, built your railroads, and he just goes on and on about you and your families will be surrounded by the most patient, faithful, law-abiding, and unredemptive <laughs> people that the world has ever seen. Yeah. You know, and it's like, we're, we're good people, wonderful, that we, we're gonna prove our worthiness, and you don't have to do anything, basically. Right. I mean, what, what is it that the, what is, what, what, what was he asking yeah. the whites to do, you know? We, the African Americans didn't create slavery, right? They didn't create the issues, the problems. If they were on the bottom, it wasn't their choice. And now we need to do something to prove our worthiness, yeah. right? That, I mean, it was. That's what he's saying, I think, yeah. 
And it's all in that metaphor of the hand, which apparently yes. was a very dramatic moment in the speech when he put out his hands like this, raised both arms and said, we can be as separate as the fingers of the hand, but together when it's important. In other words, segregation is okay. We're not going to go to your libraries or your churches or whatever. Uh, we'll work for you. That's when we're together. We'll do the work that you need. But other than that, we're not going to bother you. We won't get into politics. We won't, uh, um, you know, that was the Atlanta compromise. The compromise that he made that, again, Blacks would sort of earn their way into the right to vote and the right to uh, participate more in, in the leadership of society. Um, and the compromise was, okay, we won't mess with politics, but you need to kind of open things up. And that's what Du Bois said in his appreciation of this speech. He said, it's a good speech as long as the South lives up to, the white South lives up to opening the doors to black people which of course they were in the process of doing exactly the opposite at that time right. mm -hmm. by all of the Jim Crow laws coming in, the lynching, right. all of that. Right. And, and even, and, and that's why, uh, Barbara, it would be good to learn more about Reconstruction because yeah. all the signs were there in yeah, the yeah. South during the Reconstruction that they fought and fought, we don't want to do this. And, and there, are a lot, there was a lot of violence that went unreported. And then there was violence that was reported and nothing was done. And it was, I think, it would seem as though it was uh, widely viewed as fail. And, uh, and, and things that were promised, you know, land and things of that sort were, was taken back, given, taken back, or promised and never given. I mean, it, all the, it shouldn't have been surprising that the South was not, based on what I read and understood, that they would be willing to do, to, to just say, okay, you know, we're not, we're going to be good guys. We're not going to, we're not going to do these terrible things. We're going to be fair. I mean, Go ahead, John. Don't get well, me started. Well, that, that's the biggest flaw in Washington's argument, I think, that the South, the white Southerners didn't hold up their end of the bargain. Mm -hmm. um, and that, that's not his fault, but um, Du Bois, in retrospect, I think, felt that the conciliatory approach he took contributed to that. Right. Um, so let's look at Du Bois. We haven't talked about him yet directly. Uh, and he believes in a very different educational philosophy. He celebrates the talented 10th as the solution to racial injustice in the United States of his time. Was he right? What do you think of that idea of the talented 10th? Barbara? I'm okay with the talented 10, but I hate his emphasis on men. He rarely mentions women. Barbara, that's, I, I almost said that before John started. Both of the articles, I yes. mean, it was so, it's hard, it, it just screamed at me, you know, where yeah. are the women? Men this, men this. Uh, he mentions yeah. Phyllis Wheatley and he mentions Harriet Tubman. He might mention mm -hmm. one or two others, but that's about it. Right. I mean, it was, I thought, Oh my goodness, you know, yeah. I normally don't feel that strongly. I mean, it doesn't hit me that strongly, but it was very uh, gender exclusive, I put it that yeah. way. Which is unfortunately typical of most male writing in the 19th century and early 20th century. They're not. Yeah, but you uh, have all those women fighting back. I've been, I've been reading about the ladies. You get the same feeling industry, about the women in the uh, textile industry, they were pushing hard. They, they were working and, and earning, particularly given how in the aftermath of the Civil War, a lot of them, the men had died. So they were taking on those roles and supporting families, but they were being pushed down. 
So, you know, and they were also, a number of them, not all of them, a number of them were aligning with, with Blacks, with abolition. Uh, they were fighting for their own right to vote. I mean, they, they were moving forward quite strongly. And for me, I see this as a definite pushback, a definite closing of the door against women. For some reason, I'm so passionate this evening. <laughs> well, black, black men got the right to vote before black women. <laughs> That's true. That's so. true. They did. <laughs> and the same. Uh, yeah, I mean, for whatever worth, it did them. But yeah, they got it. But yeah, the, 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 the antagonism against women was strong. I mean, it was, it was thicker than butter exactly. on a baby. Well, if you read Alice Walker's novel Meridian about the civil rights movement, she would be seeing some of the same issues there. I'm not saying they've gone even now. Oh. I'm not arguing that. I'm just <laughs> arguing it was so palpable it in was. his wording that it almost sickened me. <laughs> <laughs> Amy? So I completely hear what you ladies are saying, and I don't disagree. It just didn't bother me because kind of like Professor Getz said, it's pretty normative for male writers. So I just kind of brushed it off the side. But what struck me again, kind of like what Barbara was just saying regarding modern times, um, and I apologize for jumping to that, but it, relating to the essay, talking about the exceptional few kind of highlights, like here are the exceptional few, which is a, not necessarily a bad philosophy. I don't know how I feel about that. I have to like let that sink in. But it just kind of made me think of Judge Jackson's confirmation hearings from last week. Like what did that woman have to do to show she's <laughs> qualified for this position? Like for the love of God. I'm sorry, I'm so sorry for going No, there, I agree like, with she, you, I'm there. She, like if you took her name off of her resume, it's indistinguishable from justices that are currently on the court and actually outshines more than half of them. So what more does she have to do to be exceptional? And in reading W.E.B. Du Bois's essay, I was like, how much more exceptional does, is the, what is the expectation for how much more exceptional someone has to be to even be considered equivalent? Does that make sense? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Amy, I think a, um, a lot of people would say that that hasn't disappeared. Um, how clearly, much more? It, yeah. You know, <laughs> it, it feels like it clearly hasn't. And mm -hmm. it's a conversation. I didn't mean to interrupt. I'm so sorry. No, I'm no, no bad. problem. <laughs> but like, yeah, I mean, it has not, it has not, yeah, <laughs> just yes. Joanne? Did anyone notice that, um, I think it's on page 51, I, first of all, I don't know where he got his statistics. I don't think it, it, did anybody see, you know, he was quoting all these numbers and statistics and things, and I thought, well, for somebody with a Harvard education, you would, and with the background he has, you would think that he would have, we would have some sources, but we don't. But on page 53, one at the very first line, he talks about the college graduates, um, which on the previous page had he had come up with a total of um, the total number of Negro college graduates up to 1899. And of these graduates, 2,079 were men and 252 were women. And I, I to talk about the fact that he so overlooked one, women, when I read that, I went, oh my God, and I went and calculated the, the percentages. 89.2% of the graduates were men, 10% 10 10.2 were women. And he bothered to even mention the women. I mean, I thought this is commendable. He, he was so, um, I mean, you know, as everybody's been saying, what do you have to do, you know? What do you have to do in order to be um, noticed by this man as, as not a man and worthy of, of um, being part of the talented 10th or the exceptional few 
or just the everyday person tilling the fields and um, raising the family and getting by and, and, and at the same time being female? What does it take? And what does it, does it take for the women, more of these women to get into college? I mean, they're certainly capable. Right. Many of them were teaching anyway. Um, John, do you know how even the term talented test was went over? Was it acceptable? What did anybody sort of raise their eyebrows at at that or at the number of women? I mean, just the, the just how just the phrase talented test. I mean, in in some ways. Uh, uh, you know, would they think that, okay, the other nine tests you just sort of put on the sidelines or something like that? Yeah, I think a lot of people thought it was elitist. Uh, okay. And that he was selling short the, the vast majority of people. That is, a, that is a critique. And that was as some of his manner he dressed in a very sometimes dance. Yeah. Kind of he addressed in what? He was a Harvard guy. He was a dandy. Oh, a oh sort okay. Of uh -huh. you know, sort of fancy, had a fancy mustache and uh, carried a cane. And uh, there, was a, there was an air about him that offended mm -hmm. some people, I think, and that made him seem more aristocratic. Sometimes people identified him as Eurocentric rather than, which is odd in a way. I mean, but he did have, he would say, I, I sit down with Shakespeare at night and the veil is lifted and I commune with Aristotle and I read all these wonderful, mm -hmm. wonderful writers. And that's great for somebody who can do that. But there's a certain amount of privilege involved in being able to, uh, able to say that and have the luxury to do that. Right. Um, and I think for somebody speaking to larger numbers of people, Washington might have had a little more, you know, ability to connect with more people in that mm -hmm. sense. Although it's, it's paradoxical for both of them, I think, because uh, Du Bois affirmed black folk culture and the spirituals and uh, black, uh, black religion in a way that, uh, that Washington really kept his distance from. He, was, he viewed that as kind of uh, holding black people back from making material progress. Mm -hmm. uh, so they're, they're both very complicated people, I think. And that's what makes them interesting, but hardly flawless. So up until like two days ago, I had read excerpts from the Talented Tenth essay, but not the whole thing. And so one of the things that struck me in reading the whole essay, you know, it, it does have, you know, the excerpts do really kind of play on this elitist and, and you know, 10% thing. Whereas when you read the whole essay, that 10% is really focused on educating everyone else. Yes. So a lot of it is, you know, let's take the, the, you know, the smart kid in school and make sure that they're the ones that become the next teachers so that we can have a bigger educational pool. And so that I hadn't really kind of put to, you know, I hadn't really thought that through before. Um, although I will also say back when I was a high school teacher, and I would have, you know, the students would be, you know, reading and comparing the two when we read the Atlanta Compromise speech and then we read excer excerpts from the Talented 10 thing. And overall, my 10th graders, you know, when I had them do an assignment, I said, either pick Booker T. Washington and tell me what's in his head or pick W.E.B. Du Bois and tell me what's in his head. It was kind of like a graphic organizer thing I used. But but overwhelmingly, I would say it was probably two thirds of the kids did Du Bois and only a third did Washington. Uh, now, whether that means that, you know, they agreed with him more, or they liked him more or whatever, I, you know, I can't make that jump, but I can say 
most of the 10th graders were more, if you had to put them into a camp, were more uh, Du Bois than Washington. Anyway, yeah, the right. idea of service was really important to him. The talented tent were not supposed to get educated just for themselves, but to share with the community, to be political leaders, to be educators. And in 1948, he revised it. He said, let's, let's call them the guiding hundredth. Uh -huh. And he was looking for alliances between uh, uh, black leaders and other minority groups. Mm -hmm. trying to build kind of a coalition there of, uh, of people. And there he was stressing morality and service even more than education by that time. So his thoughts did evolve. But uh, uh, I mean, he, he wanted black people to have access to a liberal education, to the, the kind of education that you got, Janice, at Tuskegee yeah. by that time, the school had evolved into a, you know, a first rate all around institution. Mm -hmm. And even in Washington's day, there were liberal arts courses there. Uh, it wasn't just a trade school. There was a little more, you know, so Washington's curriculum was a little more complex than, than you would get the idea. Uh, that were part of it. And then, of course, Tuskegee, especially after World War II, I think, really evolves into a high-powered, uh, uh, re even research yeah, organization. It did. And John, they made me do a lot of liberal arts courses. I, I, was, yeah. I, I enjoyed the math and science, but I had to do all those humanities courses to get through. So, uh, so you're right. Uh, that was a big part of the curriculum. Uh, you, know, the, uh, you know, I'm pleased to hear, not that it will change my life or do anything, that um, people learn and evolve. And so, I'm, John, I appreciate you talking a little bit about how uh, Du Bois evolved. Because the, just the name Talented Tenth, you know, as a teacher, I, you know, I was listening to you, Christina, and I know John taught you never know where you, when you have a class where the you are always surprised by students you just don't you can't you might go in with assumptions or or prejudged students but over time i i was always surprised by where who who would rise in ways that I just wouldn't have imagined, right? And so, you know, is the talent that tends the one with the privilege, you know, or how, how do they get there? And so to me, it is making, it's important to make, to have access and opportunities broadly available rather than a select group. I mean, that's just me. But anyway, other comments on Du Bois before we move to the next question. Okay, so in the souls of black folk, um, Du Bois writes of a childhood discovery. And I quote, then it dawned on me that I was different from the others or like mayhap and the heart and life and longing, but shut out from their world by a vast veil, end quote. The voice goes on to say that the Nero is born into a world which yields him no true self-consciousness, but only lets him see himself through the revelation of the other world. It is a particular sensation, this double consciousness, the sense of always looking at oneself through the eyes of others, of measuring one's soul by the tape of a world that looks on in amused content and pity, one ever feels his two-ness, an American, a Negro, end quote. Question, how useful do you think Du Bois, this metaphor of the, of the veil, 
and his concept of double consciousness are in understanding race relations in the U.S. today. Okay, so <laughs> when you read that, just that little section, and in fact, it's the same time period even, but that same section is just a different way to phrase Paul Lawrence Dunbar's We Wear the Mask poem. And it's still in terms of the, you know, so that whole, you know, you have to present one side to this group of people and present another side to this group of people. And, you know, the, I, the current term that we often use for that um, is code switching. And I, I follow this, you know, the NPR's code switch podcast and listen to that. And I first discovered this idea of code switching when I was in high school. And, you know, I went to a very large public high school and I was in the honors classes. And the one black girl that was also in the honors classes, I would watch the way she interacted with people in honors classes and then how she interacted with her friends in the cafeteria. And I could tell that she was like in two worlds that, you know, it just, just so that was my first kind of sociological understanding of that you know so that was happening in the eight so this is happening at the turn of the 20th century this was happening in the 1980s and i would argue that it still happens today where people have to present themselves in different ways depending on who they're interacting with and what their objective is in interacting with those people Thank you, Christina. Mm -hmm. I have always been aware that I had to do that, but I wasn't aware it was as obvious, um, except, and it really troubled me, it hurt me, in fact, but um, someone was with me in Cincinnati, John, and traveled down south. And when they got down south, they said, they said, my diction, they said, I talk, I act. And they told me how I pronounced words, which were different from how I did up here. I mean, I was so stunned that, and the person said it in a way that they were unhappy with what they saw in the south versus what I present what I was presenting in Cincinnati. And I was unaware that the gulf was that huge. So much so that, Barbara, I don't know why, but it hurt me because I, I thought I was in Cincinnati, the Janice that I was presenting. And it turned out that even though I knew I was more relaxed around my family and friends or in the South, I didn't realize it was like two different people. And so I had to think about what was that, you know, and why. And it was pretty disturbing to me. I'd just like to add, I think um, Barack Obama was often criticized for just that too, you know, so I'm not sure how to ask the question without seeming insensitive, but I genuinely want to understand what is the issue if you find yourself interacting with different groups of people differently? Why is that bad or good? Why is that anything? I mean, that is, I am a different person at work than I am at home than I am with, you know, friends on the weekend. And it's just, and I don't think that I'm, I don't consider it a bad thing. Um, I, I am not trying outside of work where I need to maintain my employment so I can continue to collect a paycheck. I am nowhere else trying to fit in, but, you know, I, I, I'm, I guess I'm, I'm wondering why, if it's a, you know, I, I'm, 
is it that we're, we're afraid people think we're insincere if we're not our real selves the entire time or something like that, which I don't think is necessarily a fair assessment. But it was just, that was just the, the thing that jumped out at me about the question, meaning absolutely no disrespect whatever to anyone that, that asks about that because it is a, a legitimate question. Amy, you want to respond to that or add to that or say something else? <laughs> kind of. Yeah, and I understand what Eric's saying. I mean, everyone has different personas that they show. Um, but I think in part of this is because Christina mentioned the Dunbar poem. So the Dunbar um, house is celebrating Paul Lawrence Dunbar's 150th anniversary. It's like a big, huge thing this whole year. So I went to a workshop where we, we read, we wear the mask, and it was the first time I had exposure to that poem. And so part of the discussion in that context was it's exhausting. That's the thing, it's exhausting. Like I, I can approach it, and one of the other words, I know you said code switching, Christina, intersectionality is the other big buzzword of the, of the year. You don't know when you approach somebody, like are you looking at me because I'm a woman? Are you looking at me because of all these other factors that you may or may not know that are identities that I may carry? So Eric, kind of to your point, it's exhausting. If I started talking in, in on this call, even the way I talk with some of my girlfriends, you would, there's a concern or a fear or an apprehension that, you know, my voice is already high pitched. If I started using like a lot and started to sound like a valley girl from when I was 10 years old, you're not going to listen to what I'm saying. So I, ha I already know I have to modulate my voice and lower it a little bit and make sure to make a conscious effort not to say like or okay or, you know, too many emphatic things or end the sentence with an up speak, which I, I can't, I can only approach the world from my own experience, my lived experience. I don't know if your voice is lower and you don't end with an up speak out of habit how the world perceives you, but I know how it feels that I get perceived. And so I don't know that from a lens of race, but I know it from a lens of gender and it's exhausting. It truly is exhausting. So I can only imagine that for people mm -hmm. who have multiple layers mm -hmm. of, of, of differentiation, it's gotta be just, just exhausting. It's kind of my take. Tony, Go ahead, Tony. Tony. Go ahead, Tony. I, I muted you for a second because I heard something in the background, but go ahead. Well, um, I, I just want to say, I think women, particularly when um, they be, got more into the business world, felt this way because you had to put on a performance to be better or to fit in with the male dominated business world. And, you know, you were always emulating what the successful men did and you know unlike today the other thing i felt i happened to come from a, a, a family that on my father's side he was from the the south and um, i have a great i have a grandfather who grew up on a plantation and my great grandfather owned a plantation so my grandfather was was he, he was raised differently, but um, he was not what I'd consider, you know, overtly prejudiced. And he grew up with young African Americans on, or Black children on the plantation and stayed friends with them. But when I would go down there, I would observe a lot of racism, even from my grandmother, who was my step grandmother, because he would invite these people over. And she didn't really want them there, but I happened to be present. And, and, but he wanted them there because he considered them friends. So she would put on a face to them, but he would hear about it when they left because she thought it was just awful. And I remember as a child hearing her like getting on a bus or a or train and being so upset that black people were on it. So I always felt when I went down south, I had to put on a different face because, you know, I wasn't used to that here, even though it was happening. It, you know, cause I'm in my seventies. So, you know, uh, but I just, it, it just seemed like I had to be careful about what I said and, and 
you know, because it was family. And even though I love them all, and I, you know, they were wonderful people, but, you know, there, there was that history there and it was something to deal with. And I never forgot it. Like you, I have this, I remember a time going to a, a, a restaurant or a mall or something and malls were just starting. I believe Lenox Square had just started and we went in to go to the bathroom and I saw the one bathroom had the picture of this woman and she had something tied around her head and she was, you know, I thought she was really cool. So that's the bathroom I wanted to go into. And I got quite the lecture on how nice young white women don't do that. And that was where the maid at one of the families would go, you know, who I knew. And I just said, well, I want to go in there too, because I like her too. And I want to go in there. So I got into all kinds of trouble for it. So I never forgot that as I got older. It was, it was very, I don't know, it was very like a slap in the face. And I really didn't get it, but I started to look at those things very early in life. That's all I had to say. I didn't get to read all of it. I just decided to come today. So. Eric, um, you and I should have lunch sometime. Maybe I could tell you <laughs> tell you a lot more. But, oh, I believe so. <laughs> but I grew up. I mean, I when I came to Cincinnati, I had a very southern. You you could tell right away, and people even today can hear certain words and say, you know, I can hear the southern accent. Um, so I needed. There was a lot of pressure that I felt to fit in and be accepted at a predominantly white Catholic institution and a department that was all white and all white male. And so um, how do I dress? How do I act? How do I speak? When do I speak were all things I had to navigate. And when I stepped out of line or I learned, I mean, um, if I said a word that um, we don't say that in Cincinnati, it, uh, that way in Cincinnati, they would call me out. They would sort of laugh and say, what did you say? Could you say that again? And, you know, things like that. Or if I wore something that I used to wear in the South or, oh, you know, it was, it stood out. So it was an ongoing issue of how do, how, how do they see me and how must I behave, how, and how well I have to do to be seen as competent. And if you have all those constraints on you all the time, it's pretty heavy. And you, um, and so it was freedom when they weren't there. And so a new, another person would just emerge that was obvious to people. I think that's that just, sense? I just think that is very normal though for all of us to hit our comfort zone. And, you know, and whether it's because you're a woman or because you are a black woman, you know, I, I think the one thing that, we have in common is being women and uh and humans and i think we have to have to look at that you know and recognize that women have to work together <laughs> because it's been hard for all women but black women particularly had had the worst but today with their probably graduating from college more than any other group of people. And I think that's fabulous. 
Joanne, you wanted to make a comment before. Oh, I'll pass. Okay. I'd, I'd like to say something real quick. Um, I, I just think it's interesting to circle back to the hearings for Judge Katanji Brown Jackson and, and to think about this code switching thing there because it was interesting to me watching that um, and all the different um, people who were questioning her and you know what political party they come from or what gender they are, whatever. I mean, even within the Democratic Party, if you compared Senator Blumenthal's questions to her, like he kind of tried to throw her a softball at one point to say, you know, talk about how historic your nomination is and that sort of thing. But he kind of kept going and he kind of said too much. And I sort of wish that he had just stopped being a white man, like stopped with an easy, like a short question and let her talk more versus if you compare that to Cory Booker being a black male talking to her and asking her questions. He, he went on a lot too both men did rather than just stopping and letting her talk more but uh, i was just wondering what was going through her mind with all those different people and then the awful questions that some of the other senators the accusations they threw at her and stuff like how awful that or how how difficult that would be to be on display for the entire country right there on tv and having to navigate those different roles in your life right like as a judge as a woman, as a black woman, as a uh, the daughter of teachers, as someone who you know went to Harvard, and uh, I don't know if you all heard that the story that she told about how a black woman passed her on the, the quad or whatever on campus and just said one word to her, persevere. I mean, there's so many layers to that. It was just chilling to me, and and as a white woman myself, I know I can't even begin to understand all the all the the issues there, but it's just fascinating to me to think about where all those different things intersect, you know, and there she is on display in front of the whole country having to deal with that. And she was so composed. I mean, a, a couple of tears when Cory Booker was talking to her, but I can't imagine being that composed under that kind of pressure, you know, so. She had to. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. so, didn't you wonder what she did when she went home? <laughs> And what did she throw or what did she say to her husband or to her very closest friends? What, what, what I kept thinking, oh my God, <laughs> what, what would you do? You know, how would you deal with that when you were- Joanne, I feel like I threw enough things at the TV for her. <laughs> <laughs> well, we will be blessed when she is finally put in her position as a justice. We will be blessed. Barbara, your hand is up. Yeah, I've been trying to figure out how I want to, or how I could respond to this question because it's such an emotional one. Mm -hmm. um, and what comes to mind, um, sometimes some of us have seen little children when they're walking in groups and they are being contained by a halter where, um, so that they don't stray, mm -hmm. so they don't get out of hand. I would have to say to a great extent, and this is my personal experience, which may not only be my personal experience, as a black person, as a black woman, I am forever wearing that halter. And I am not in control of that halter. It's controlled by others who are telling me always that I have to be under control. And if I'm not under control, I'm under penalty. That's right. And that penalty can go from minor, a diminishment of self-worth, to major, a denial of life. But there's always that halter. And we have to persevere despite that halter but we know it's there and we feel it every minute, even when we're sleeping. And no, we can't do whatever we want, whenever we want in whatever circumstance. We may not even want to, maybe because that's never been on the table. The only thing that's on the table is that halter, that diminishment, that denial. 
And it happens a lot. Yes. A lot. And we saw it with uh, that wonderful, wonderful woman who braved all those questions. Mm -hmm. And we saw it with Cory Booker when he said to her, you are here, you deserve to be here. And our parents brought us forth because they loved us. And that's the only thing that has fought against that halter. But it is always there. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't matter what room or how high you go. No, I was vice president. Yeah, um, I was a vice president Washington at Xavier, and We've all I couldn't raise it. my voice at a meeting. Yes. If I raise my voice at a meeting, the word hit campus, John, and it got back to me that Janice Walker was kicked. <laughs> I couldn't do it. I couldn't make a mistake on a PowerPoint. I was unprofessional. Yes. I couldn't mis I couldn't mispronounce someone's name. I used to. We John had to be perfect. After, I, had to be perfect. To be I had to be perfect. I had to. I would literally call the people that whose names I would pronounce and tell them. So how do you say your name? And I swear, John, there were times I was called out because I got it right, and they thought somebody else thought it was wrong. I mean, they got it wrong, and they would correct me, correct me when I had done that. So it was, you have to be perfect. You have to behave in ways that I think are acceptable. Otherwise, I was penalized. Yeah. And all that did was put more pressure on me next time. Janice, you can't do this. You can't do that. Remember this. Remember that. My mother told me, if you get a 99, you fail. You have to get a 100. You have to get a 100 every single time. That was what was put on her. And that's what's been put on all of us. We have to be perfect in an imperfect world. We can't do what we want. We don't have that leeway. And that, that name reading you're talking about is a good example of being measured by a tape that belongs to somebody else because yes. name readers at graduations and honors convocations mispronounce names all exactly. the time. Exactly. People used to butcher names all the time. But if, John, I would stand there and if I got a name wrong, someone in the audience or the person would turn, you know, sometimes people would, I, I, I remember I literally called uh, Mac Mariani and said, Mac, I'm sorry, your name was on a PowerPoint that one of my associate deans put together was Miss Bell. And he said, Janice, it happens all the time. But I felt terrible because I heard someone got reported back that she's so unprofessional. She can't even get she, names right. She can't even get uh, spelled get the names correct on a PowerPoint. And I, I can't go back and say, I didn't do it. You know, I had my associate dean. I assumed that they were correct. Someone came to my office, John, and said, uh, why don't you let me come by and work with the pronunciations before she goes to a college meeting? That was dean. <laughs> oh, jeez. It didn't get, I mean, it didn't stop when I, when I moved up. It was just a different room. I just said to old people, I said, look, it might look, I might be in a different room, but I'm experiencing much of the same things, whether or not, you know, you're over here, I'm over here. I'm just with a different group. Sad. All right, Amy. So, Eric, that's why I felt free. When I... <laughs> <laughs> the halter wasn't on me for a while when I was at home with my family. <laughs> yeah, we could take it off a little bit. Right. But it had to go right back on. It had to go back 
go go back. Uh, yeah, I had to go back. Yes, on. aren't you? Are you retiring? Is that? Yeah. When is that? I, I'm trying by the end of this year, at least. I'm trying really hard. And then you will what? I don't know. Go back, back to I, might, I might. I uh, might. I might uh, uh, hang out with John and read books. <laughs> <laughs> Well, read the reconstruction book. All right. Th this has been a lovely discussion. It is 8.38, though. <laughs> so um, I'm going to ask John and, and Professor Walker if you want to, you know, do what your wrap up -y thingies that you like to do. Well, first call me Janet. <laughs> <laughs> John, you can wrap up and we can say good night. Well, I, I think that, <laughs> I think what has been said tonight is so eloquent that I can't add anything to it, really. I'm just appreciative of the wonderful openness and the, the power of this discussion. Thank you for making it possible. <laughs> Very good. All right, anything else no. before we um, adjourn? I just want to say I, uh, I, I don't know you all. You all know each other. Well, I know one or two of you. <laughs> but um, I'm surprised that I was, that I shared some of the things that I did. Uh, there's a lot more, but um, we all learn, grow, and evolve together. And we, in order to do that, we have to we have to be able to have these conversations. And Eric, so I appreciate you asking that question um, because if you don't know, you won't know until you ask. And and Barbara, I appreciate your willingness to talk and share some things that I know were painful to you. Um, and I'm, I question whether or not I would have been able to do it without your presence. So <laughs> I don't think I would have. I certainly cannot speak for <laughs> uh, Christina or uh, anyone else, but definitely Dr. Walker and Dr. Getz, extremely appreciative of you guys being willing to host a discussion such as this. It is, I'm always learning. That's why I attend these things. So thank you. And you usually attend from the background. So I'm glad that you um, came on to <laughs> discuss and talk. Um, Repetitious. <laughs> Oh, uh, that, and since they're, they both had me as a student at one point. <laughs> <laughs> Mercifully, they don't remember. So we can change. Tell me your last name. <laughs> it's not happening. Yeah, put your last name up. <laughs> All <laughs> right. <Last name. laughs> All right, well, on that happy note, hmm, um, again, thank you all for coming. Uh, next month is a Native American teacher writing. Is that correct, John? That is correct. Okay, so, uh, and we'll have as a, a co-host for that one, a, um, actually she's a friend of Abigail's, our, our communications manager, and she is, a, an Afro, or a, a Native American, and she's a teacher, so it, it, it will it will play into the readings, which I am not familiar with. So I'd have to do a little homework myself. But um, I appreciate all of you coming to spend time with us at the Harriet Beecher Stowe House, and all of your candid discussion, and all of the the wonderful connections that we seem to to be able to pull out and talk about and think through together so i appreciate that and um you know 
send me an email if you have any additional questions. Make sure you register for next month's um, discussion as well. And uh, the just I'm going to point out one more thing, and that is the um, semicolon club discussion, which takes place on Saturday mornings. That one will be on April 23rd is the book The Sum of Us by Heather McGee. And that discussion will be facilitated by one of our other um, docents who is an educator and his name is Tim Krause. So uh, come, come back for that one. That one you can either attend in person here at the house or online. Uh, we'll have a camera set up so that people can see what's going on in the room and amongst the other Zoom participants. So, all right, I'm gonna sign off, but thank you all very much. And uh, again, let me know if you have any more questions. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks mm -hmm. everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank, thank you all. You. Good night. Good night. Good night. Thank you all.